Well, many people say that poverty globally is declining because it's declining in China and India, which are, of course, the two largest countries in the world. And it is true that more people are joining the middle class in China and India. But in the traditional areas of poverty, including in China and India, which are majority are rural areas, uh, poverty is not declining. And in Africa and in other places like Bangladesh, poverty is actually increasing. And I think when we talk about poverty, we also have to talk about the so-called developed countries, because there is more poverty in the United States than there was, say, 20, 25 years ago. So this is a general phenomenon which goes along, I think, with much greater inequalities. There's more very rich people at the top, but there is a huge gap with many middle class people or who could have become middle class people dropping into the poverty trap. So it's hard to say globally how many people there are. Well, between about 1980, when you have Margaret Thatcher in Britain and Ronald Reagan in the United States, there is a whole philosophy that comes into play and is more or less imposed or accepted in the rest of the world called neoliberalism. Sometimes in America it's called neoconservatism, but it means let the market work its magic, let the market make the decisions, and don't intervene if you're the government. Well, when the market makes the major decisions, it gives to those who already have, which is perfectly normal, because if you have a lot of money, you are going to be able to take advantage of market, market opportunities. But people who have no material basis are going to be pushed further and further outside, and they are going to drop further and further on the scale of, of wealth. And that is what has happened um, over the past um, 20, 25 years. Another big factor in this is not just the blind operation of the market. It is also the interventions of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank, which have been assigned the task of imposing what are called structural adjustment packages on poor, indebted countries. And what do those packages say? They say you have to privatize everything, you have to concentrate uh, all of your resources on export, which is normal because they are indebted, so they are not going to earn any hard currency to pay back their debtors unless they export. But that means that people locally are going to be neglected. It's also saying put your interest rates up very, very high, so that makes it virtually impossible for poorer people to borrow. In a general way, it removes resources which would otherwise be better spread among the population and sends them to northern banks and northern governments. We have made a little progress on reducing debt, but only a little. Uh, because the vast majority of indebted countries are still paying out huge amounts. Let me give you just one statistic, which I worked out in minutes, because otherwise it's un incomprehensible. Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the poorest part of the world, is paying $25,000 every minute to northern creditors. Well, you could build a lot of schools, a lot of hospitals, a lot of job, you could make a lot of job creation if you were using $25,000 a minute differently from debt repayment. So there's this drain, and I think people don't understand that it is actually the South that is financing the North. If you look at the flows of money from north to south and then from south to north, what you find is that the south is financing the north to the tune of about $200 billion every year. Some people say more, but 200 is the rock bottom estimate, 200 billion. So there's a constant drain, 
you have huge debt repayments which are going every year from the south to the north. Only 18 of the very poorest countries have received any debt relief. Others continue to pay and will never get out of the debt trap. So that is many billions on that side. Then you have another phenomenon, which is the underpaying of commodities. These countries have been told for years that they have to increase their export production. They have to plant more cotton, more cocoa, more coffee, uh, more tea, etc., etc. And they then have to export that. But since the same advice is going to everyone, because this is the only way for many countries to pay off their debt, and they don't have a big diversification of their exports. They do produce more, but when everybody is trying to put those same goods on the market, you don't have to have a PhD in economics, which I do not have, by the way, uh, to understand that that is going to push down the prices for everyone. When there's too great a supply, the prices will go down. So their exports are undervalued. So they don't earn enough uh, in, in that way either. They lose some of their best brains. There is an outflow of human beings, both for the brawn and for the brains, which is also a, a big outflow. But the major outflow is the debt, which is going back every year uh, to the northern countries, the northern banks, and the northern governments. Well, what we have to understand is that there was a lot of binge borrowing in the 1970s. And let's be clear from the outset that those who did the borrowing are not the same people who are making sacrifices to pay back now. This is one of the biggest transfers of responsibility that has ever occurred, I think, in human history, where you have the upper middle classes and the upper classes borrowing like mad, and then suddenly, when they can't get any credit anymore, uh, and the International Monetary Fund comes in and says, look, we've got to clean this up, and we're going to put you under structural adjustment. We're going to put you under austerity policies. Then, suddenly, it's the responsibility of the poor people in the society to pay back what was borrowed. What was borrowed? A lot for armaments. Probably 20 to 25 percent of the total burden was borrowed to purchase military products, which are never productive. If you borrow for productive reasons, that's fine. You know, I mean, you invest something and then you produce more wealth, and normally debt should not be a problem because it should be invested in productive activities. But uh, what has happened also under structural adjustment is that the World Bank and the IMF have insisted that everything that was public be privatized. All of the public companies whether they had to do with investing in agriculture or whether they were public telephone companies or public whatever, roads companies or all of that, or nearly all, has had to be privatized. So there again, you get an opportunity for private companies to extract wealth. So it is true, we now know that there was a plan for extracting resources, for extracting cash, and that it is no accident that these countries have been, in a sense, recolonized, because nobody wants to do classical colonialism now. It's too visible. You have to have an army to, to enforce it. It takes an administration. Uh, it, this is completely out. But colonization doesn't have to be through an army and administration and overt means. It can be through, through debt. And I think that Perkins's book and other much other evidence, because he speaks mainly about two or three countries, but uh, whether it was intentional or not, the debt accumulation has certainly been used to keep those countries in line, to say you will vote at the UN in such a way, or you will pay back so much a year, and if you don't, you won't get any new loans from anyone. And so it, it is a very useful tool, uh, but of course not for the people concerned. I think the North bears a huge responsibility um, and has been, how shall I say, very clever about the way
it has orchestrated many things because the debt was perhaps not thought out in advance as a tool for creating what you might call neo-colonialism and for extracting resources. But once it was accumulated, it was certainly clear that that, that, that would be an excellent tool to keep on extracting uh, resources. So uh, we underpay commodities. We continue to extract uh, money every year which on a debt which we know will never be paid. Uh, we are... Uh, selective about immigrants, but we often take the best brains and the best brawn uh, from the South. Uh, all in all, I would say that we have more control than we did in the 19th century. There is definitely overproduction now in the South, and that is also a fact of life with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, because what they say is you've got to produce whatever you can produce in order to earn hard currency, in order to pay back your debt. So it's not surprising that there is overproduction. Vietnam, for instance, during the Vietnam War, never produced coffee before the Vietnam War. Afterwards, it was moving more and more into being a normal country in the normal um, trading relations, and it's the bank and the fund, and particularly the bank that loaned a lot for coffee production. We've got a, a structural surplus of coffee in the world. So the price is in the basement, and many coffee farmers in Brazil and elsewhere, but particularly in Africa, because the quality they produce is not the one that's most sought after, because partly because of Vietnamese production, which has increased supply like that and demand has remained static. So it's not surprising that the income for those countries has plummeted. Um, I say financial low-intensity conflict because I think debt has been a more effective tool than arms. You don't have to go in and hang a lot of people and scare them to death and um, march them to, uh, to the gold mines. You don't have to be so obvious. Now you can do it through, uh, through finances. Uh, and there have been lots of campaigns, and they've had a little success. But if you traced what has happened since 1997, when the first anti-debt campaigns really got off the ground, the IMF and the World Bank, but also the northern governments, have been dragging their feet so that they say, oh, well, fine, but you need another three years and then another three years after that. So now you need another six years of structural adjustments. You really have to get your house in order the way we tell you to do it, uh, which results in a few rich people and quite a lot of poor ones. Uh, and then we will talk about debt relief. Well, they have given some debt relief to some countries. And when they do that, in countries like Tanzania, for instance, the government has used that uh, reduction in its debt, for example, to say we don't charge school fees anymore. The enrollment of girls in school has shot up by two-thirds. So you don't educate girls, that means you increase the birth rate, that means you increase the pressure on the land, that means there's more poor people. All of this is cause and effect, and it's very easy to show that this is the way it is. However, it's not for that reason that more debt relief is granted or that we say um, in one voice, well, let's get rid of this now. We've been profiting from this situation for 25 years. Enough is enough. Let's let those people try to develop. Let's give them this um, huge amount of money, which is something like, what is debt service now, altogether? Um, it must be on the order of half a trillion dollars a year. I would have to check the figure because I haven't added up the 
interest paid recently. I'm not working on debt right now. But it is a huge amount of money, which would be far greater than the aid which is given, often tied aid, so that it means that you may get some money, but you've got to spend it on products from country X, Y, or Z. So we could improve the life situation quite easily. And the banks are aware that they have profited from this situation for years and years. They could easily take a hit, particularly for Africa. African debt is peanuts for us, frankly. It's huge for them, but for us, it's very little. And we could cancel all of that tomorrow, but that would mean also losing leverage, losing the power to say, you do this, you do that, you vote this way in the UN, you don't make a wave about this corporation doing whatever it is doing in your country, etc., etc. I have heard stories from, from Southern people. I once asked a Brazilian minister, I won't tell you which one, why, considering the debt service that he was paying, why he didn't get together with some other, uh, other finance ministers in the region and say, can't pay, won't pay, or we're going to reduce every year by 20% or something like that. And he said, I tried, but um, the countries that I had contacted, he'd contacted two other countries, got very interesting phone calls from the State Department in the U.S. explaining everything that would happen to them if they went along with this plan. So, um, you know, I mean, leverage is leverage, and blackmail is blackmail. And it's so easy to hide this from people because it's about money, you see. I mean, it's not about sending in an army and clubbing children or something. It's not like that. It's, you've got to have a bit of background. You've got to follow the figures. You've got to take an interest in this sort of thing to see where it's evolving. So most people are simply not aware of, of what goes on. And they think, oh, well, we're giving aid. And that's a very good thing, which it is, except that one, aid is tied. And two, it is far surpassed by the outflows uh, coming from uh, southern countries which are quote-unquote aided. It seems probably bizarre to people who have borrowed themselves to buy their house or whatever. I mean, you know that after a certain time and you've paid every month, at some point this debt is going to be wiped out. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way with north to south debt. And it doesn't necessarily mean that countries are actually borrowing more. But what happens is that it is impossible for them to pay back all the interest that they theoretically owe, because the interest rates are also very high, and many of them were fixed in the 1970s when interest rates, in the 80s, when interest rates went sky high. So they can't reimburse everything. So what they don't reimburse, let's say Africa is paying back about, it, every year it's between 12 and 15 billion. Let's say 12. They can only pay back six or seven. The extra five or six gets added onto the principal. So the following year, they owe more interest because the principal is greater. So the following year, they can pay even less so on what they theoretically owe. So that is added, again, to the sum on which they are paying interest. So it's a lose-lose game. You simply cannot win this game. And my contention has been for many years that this is for good reason and that one could perfectly well uh, reduce interest rates or simply cancel the debt, which I think would be the much preferable solution, and we are beginning to pay. I wrote a book called The Debt Boomerang in the early 90s. One of those boomerangs was immigration. If you don't allow people to make a decent living where they are, 
they will necessarily try to go where they believe, rightly or wrongly, that they can make a decent living. And we have done everything to make it impossible for people to earn a proper wage and be able to bring up a family and have a house and have a normal life where they live. And having done all of this, then we say, oh, surprise, surprise, they try to get into our countries. So in Europe, we have, in the Canary Islands, people arriving in these leaky boats, hundreds of people arriving on the beach. You have in the United States, Mexicans and Central Americans and even Chinese trying to get in through any port. You have whole rings of criminals, gangs, that transport these people for huge amounts of money. They, it's a lucrative business. Well, there, there are a lot of boomerangs. One of them is uh, on exports and therefore on wages from the United States or Europe because uh, if you want to export, you've got to export to someone who is able to pay your prices. You can't undersell your actual cost of production. So if you are uh, expecting people to be able to buy your products, they've got to have the wherewithal uh, to, to, to invest in your products, which means that they've got to earn a fair income for their own. Uh, trade is always a two-way street. But since we have diverted a huge amount of, of cash into the repayment of the banks, which is, or the governments, which is sterilizing money, actually. Uh, we take away from what could be actually devoted to buying our products. I don't have recent figures on how many jobs we have lost uh, because of that. My, I did this work in the 1980s, and I don't, uh, I don't know what it is now, but I am quite sure that the principle is the same because we are not selling what otherwise we could normally sell to these countries if they had a normal progression of their levels of wealth and if wealth were better distributed and did not remain in a single uh, small elite, which has offshored its money anyway, so it's not contributing very, the elites still offshore their money. They still send their dollars or whatever uh, to New York or, or London. For example, the banks in Mexico, I would say, are now 95% American-owned in one way or another. They may have Mexican names, but they are American-controlled. And there are other cases like that. So that after, say, 20 years of these forced privatizations, you have a situation where anything that's worth anything has already been taken over. And when the private sector takes over, whether these were public companies or, or private, um, usually, I mean, they were public companies before, um, although there have also been sales of private companies to foreigners, um, naturally, you have higher prices to the consumer because we're not talking public services anymore. We're talking profit-making operations. And a public service, when it's run at cost or some, simply for the replacement cost, is going to be either subsidized or it's going to be cheaper for the consumer. But that has been practically wiped out. Uh, and also, um, there don't seem to be many signs of, of these uh, ever coming back, although we can easily quantify and, and see qualitatively what the impact on ordinary people has been. Um, there are many impacts which are boomerangs because they, they come back and hit the people who, who threw them to begin with. But I would like to stress that ordinary people in the United States or in Europe or Canada or wherever are not responsible for this. It's their governments. It's a very small elite which has in many ways organized um, the debt crisis ever since 1982. And they have done an excellent job of keeping uh, their arrangements quite dark. Most people don't know these things. You have to dig a bit to understand what's actually going on. This debt, we have to face it. It's never going to be paid. That's not the point. The point is not getting back that money. 
The point is that this debt will always be hanging over the heads of the debtors because it is a huge source of political control. If you look at the, know, the votes in the UN, if you look at who will join you in Iraq or who will not at least complain about certain actions, etc., well, it's a very good tool. It's one among many tools, but it's still a, a useful one, which will not be given up without a fight. Um, after the Second World War and until about the beginning of the 1970s, the top 1% in the United States got about 8% of the income. Since then, 30 years later, that's been doubled. They now get 16% of the income. And that's kind of extreme. But in other countries, it's been the same way because it's normal. Markets give to those who have. So if you have a, an entirely market economy with no social breaks put on, no social arrangements so that it's not just the survival of the fittest, you will, you will get much greater inequalities. You'll get many more poor people at the bottom and a fringe of rich people at the top who make billions. And I guess this year the Forbes list does not include any multimillionaires because even if you have $999 million, that's not enough. Everyone on their 400 list is now a billionaire. Uh, so 1,000 million and up. Uh, you're going to have, you can't have everything, you know. Um, and this is not true just in the richer countries. It's also been applied in the southern countries so that you have some very rich people, a thin fringe, and then you have an awful lot of, of people who are struggling to make ends meet. You have a lot of people who are losing their land because they are indebted also at the local level. Uh, who are losing their land and therefore cannot feed their families anymore. So they go into the cities, they try to find a job. There's too many people there. Uh, wages are rock bottom, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so they go to the slums, they, which are neither in a city or in the country. They're sort of this middle planet that, where there's very few opportunities. And you get increased crime, you get... Uh, more kids not in school, you get uh, um, unhealthy populations, you get the spread of AIDS, uh, you get all these things. So is that what we want? Sometimes when I look at these things with an objective eye, I think, well, yeah, that must be what, must be what they want. Because otherwise, the way to change that is really quite obvious. I'm not talking about communism, I'm talking about sort of what existed in the United States from the New Deal on, which is taxation, redistribution, public services, um, an equal share, if well, not an equal share, but an equal opportunity. That You used to talk about that a lot in the United States. But equal opportunity, that means everybody gets a good education, everybody gets good health care, everybody has a place to live, more or less luxurious, but a place to live. People should have access to transportation, uh, etc. And if they have none of that, then we should not be surprised that they get mired in poverty uh, and that we have huge inequalities in the world. It's not mysterious. How does a market economy create inequalities? Uh, in simple language, the simple language was invented long ago. It's them as has gets, right? I mean, a popular phrase, uh, at least in the United States, and them as has gets in a market economy where there are no safeguards coming from the political sphere which are going to give a bit of balance to this. And what I see happening all over the world is that if you imagine the world as a kind of sphere 
you have the economic sphere, which is here on the outside, which is dictating everything to society. And in my ideal world, I would have society and politics on the outside, and they would be dictating their law to the economy, because the economy is a good servant, but a bad master. Uh, however, with the um, advent, well, in the United States of the Republican Party, but in Britain with Mrs. Thatcher and many other governments of the same kind, um, you had a whole period of imposing neoliberalism. What, what does globalization mean? Globalization by itself means nothing. Globalization in practice has meant what I would call neoliberal globalization or market-led globalization in which the idea is that uh, everywhere you have to rely on the market to set wages, prices, no subsidies, uh, allow larger fish to eat smaller fish, allow any corporation anywhere to go in and buy up a smaller one so that you get a concentration of resources not just at the national level, but you get it at the international level as well. Um, so globalization has contributed to inequality and, you know, for the first time in about the last 15 or 20 years, what Henry Ford said in the United States doesn't work anymore. Henry Ford said in the 20s, I pay my workers so they can buy my cars. Very simple formula. I pay my workers a good salary. Why? Because I want there to be demand for my cars, which worked. Mass era of everybody can have an automobile, everybody can have a decent level. And globalization destroys that. Because when you can go cross boundary, you can find somebody to produce those cars, not at all at the wages that Henry Ford was prepared to pay. And so more and more things are being offshored. And it worked so long as a country was national. And the laws were national. With globalization, you have a situation where anyone can invest anywhere. And a transnational co -op, uh, corporation is going to take advantage of this in order to get not just the cheapest labor, but the cheapest labor with the highest qualifications. So China is turning out to be absolutely the best place you can imagine to invest because not only are there a lot of cheap laborers, but also there are a bunch of very high-level university graduates who have competed uh, with tens of thousands of others and who come out on top. These people are highly qualified and a company, for example, like Nokia from Finland, which makes mobile phones, has opened five research centers in China where in just three of them, I know they don't give the full employment figures, but in just three of those, there's 900 scientists that are working. And they are working for, what, 10, 15, 20 times less than Western scientists? And that we should not say, well, globalization is inevitable, and we have to globalize everything, and that we will globalize the jobs to the country that is not only the most populous, but also has the biggest lid on labor, because it's a very repressive country. People can't go on strike. People can't make demands. So. Uh, if we are competing on the grounds of we are free and we have trade unions and there there are no trade unions and people are not free and they are they're costing 10 to 20 times less, what kind of freedom is that? I think we have to think much more deeply about trade in general, about transnational globalization, neoliberal globalization in general. I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is that this should be a major debate because not everybody is going to be in a position to earn their livelihood 
as a part of this economy where it is quite easy to offshore your production, all of it, and then sell the results of that production back in the United States or back in Europe. And this is going to affect everyone. So there are people who are saying we should have a rule like site here to sell here. You want to sell here? Fine. You should have a plant so that you can sell the production of that plant. You want to sell in China? Fine. Offshore everything. But then don't say you're going to come in and sell to us. So there's a lot of ideas like that floating around. Well, there are topics where Western ideas, I think, should be defended. Uh, after all, it's Western countries that invented democracy in the 18th century. We had revolutions about that. We had wars about it. And I think it's a, a proper gain. And I'm not someone who says, well, whatever the laws are locally, they are the best for those people. I don't think, for example, that female circumcision is a good idea. I think it's a terrible idea and should be got rid of. And I will never defend a certain number of local practices just because they're local and say it's not my business. Um, and so I think democracy as it has been practiced for 200 and some years, uh, is a good thing for those who have been able to benefit from it. But what I do see happening is, for example, in the European Union, I get the feeling with the last constitution that they proposed to us that what they really want to do is to put the economy first. It's as if they were saying democracy was an OK parenthesis for 200 years. But now let's let the experts get on with it. Let's let those who have the money and the uh, influence make the decisions. That Everything was organized as if that was what their desire was. And I am an old-fashioned believer in helping to introduce uh, democracy where one can. But that has to be done with sensitivity for local cultures. For example, in Iran, what, in Iraq, sorry, in Iraq, what has happened um, is very much the destruction uh, of Iraq because local cultures were not at all taken into account. There was a sort of one-size-fits-all attitude. There was very little local participation, particularly popular participation. And the whole thing has been a, a complete a fiasco, not to say worse than that. So this is difficult, but I think when you give people a chance to make their voices heard, they will do so. And they will make decisions which are intelligent ones for the whole society, which is why I welcome the election of someone like Lula. This is why I welcome uh, the appearance of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, whom the U.S. is probably going to try to get rid of, but he has been elected more times than uh, most U.S. politicians, and he's putting up his mandate again for re-election in December. Um, uh, this is why I think Evo Morales in a very poor country like Bolivia is probably going to do more for the poor Bolivians than the kind of oligarchs, the very rich people that they have had through more or less honest elections up to now, etc., etc. I think that there is progress being made in some places. Uh, but we could, in the North, do much more to make democratic conditionality uh, part of our own programs and not always side uh, with the bad guys, which is what we tend to do. Um, the WTO goes much farther than the World Trade Organization, uh, goes much farther than any other trade agreement that has ever existed in the world. It doesn't just cover goods. It covers services. It covers intellectual property. It covers all kinds of agreements on how much pesticides can be on a, a vegetable that you import uh, or 
what kinds of technical barriers to trade can you have? Can you say, no, we won't accept that export because the standards are not as high as our own standards? It covers just about everything you can imagine. And in the sectors that you would least expect, like education, health, transport, um, all of the services which are often considered as public services. So this organization, which is not even part of the UN, is extremely powerful. Another reason it's powerful is that it has what they call the dispute resolution mechanism, which can hear disputes between countries and give a verdict and then propose to the winner that they sanction the loser. For example, in Europe, the U.S. challenged us on hormone-fed beef because the Europeans were refusing to import hormone-fed beef, saying we don't know about the health results of this and we think it's dangerous. And the U.S. was saying this is trade restrictive and you haven't proved anything about health. And so they won. And what did they do? They immediately put sanctions on certain products. And one of the best known ones, at least in France, is that they put sanctions on Roquefort, Roquefort cheese. They raised the duty by 100%. So Roquefort farmers, sheep raisers, who live in a very poor part of France, very little possibility to grow anything else, just have sheep pastures, and that's about it, uh, suddenly they had their sales, which were cut by a third to a half because there was no more American purchases of this cheese. And it wasn't their fault. They'd had nothing to do with the, the decision not to buy hormone-fed beef, but they were the ones who were punished for it. And that's still going on, that kind of sanctioning. Um, so I think we need much fairer trade rules, and particularly we need trade rules which take labor rights into account, uh, which take human rights into account, which take environmental necessities into account, which is not the case now uh, of the World Trade Organization. So that's what I've been working on most personally because I think this is a hugely urgent um, project. And now that the talks are stalled in what's called the Doha round, what is happening? Well, immediately they go for bilateral agreements, which may be even more demanding on the part partner countries. So maybe you will win one here, but you lose something on the other side. It's always an uphill fight. Well, there's never any free gifts in international relations. It's always a tit for tat, quid pro quo. Um, and naturally, the whole game of international relations is to try to get leverage. And it's not surprising, therefore, that in exchange for some debt relief, there should be demands made on these countries. And I think that that is just a fact of life. However, there are some countries which are, let's face it, less worth exploiting than others. I gave the example of Tanzania, which has used its debt reduction in a very intelligent way. So, to some extent, has Uganda. So have some other countries which have made improvements in health care. <laughs>
majority are rural areas, uh, poverty is not declining. And in Africa and in other places like Bangladesh, poverty is actually increasing. And I think when we talk about poverty, we also have to talk about the so-called developed countries because there is more poverty in the United States than there was, say, 20, 25 years ago. So this is a general phenomenon which goes along, I think, with much greater inequalities. There's more very rich people at the top, but there is a huge gap with many middle class people or who could have become middle class people dropping into the poverty trap. So it's hard to say globally how many people there are. Well, between about 1980, when you have Margaret Thatcher in Britain and Ronald Reagan in the United States, there is a whole philosophy that comes into play and is more or less imposed or accepted in the rest of the world called neoliberalism. Sometimes in America it's called neoconservatism, but it means let the market work its magic, let the market make the decisions, and don't intervene if you're the government. Well, when the market makes the major decisions, it gives to those who already have, which is perfectly normal, because if you have a lot of money, you are going to be able to take advantage of market, market opportunities. But people who have no material basis... Well, many people say that poverty globally is declining because it's declining in China and India, which are, of course, the two largest countries in the world. And it is true that more people are joining the middle class in China. Well, many people say that poverty globally is declining because it's declining in China and India, which are, of course, the two largest countries in the world. And it is true that more people are joining the middle class in China and India. But in the traditional areas of poverty, including in China and India, which are majority are rural areas, uh, poverty is not declining. And in Africa and in other places like Bangladesh, poverty is actually increasing. And I think when we talk about poverty, we also have to talk about the so-called developed countries because there is more poverty in the United States than there was, say, 20, 25 years ago. So this is a general phenomenon which goes along, I think, with much greater inequalities. There's more very rich people at the top, but there is a huge gap with many middle class people or who could have become middle class people dropping into the poverty trap. So it's hard to say globally how many people there are.